Hello, everyone, and welcome to another message from Fountain Springs Church. My name is Todd, and I'm a pastor at FSC. I'm so glad that you're joining us, but no, you're not just joining me, but our in-person and online platforms as we all worship God together. Today, we're gonna to hear another message from one of our pastors, which, spoiler alert, it could be me. And it's been shortened a bit to be broadcasted here on your screen. If you wanna to listen to the whole message, go to our website at fs.church messages. Again, we are so glad you're joining us. We've got these moments. Many of us have at least one moment that drew us, tipped us over in a minute going, man, I think there might be something legit about this creator almighty God. And you, cause you had this moment, but cause you're normal, you, you went on, you, you moved on, not in a mean way, not even in a rebellious way. You just, the next month played out. <laughs> You had the moment, you still remember the moment, but then you had the month. And then before you know it, the year plays out. You still remember the moment. The moment's still a big deal to you. In fact, the story I tell you at the beginning, right, about, about this guy who has this moment, I, he doesn't forget the moment. He doesn't say, oops, I totally lost. No. no, we begin to do life and we get embedded in the months and the years of, you make a list, responsibilities, problems, dreams, aspirations, uh, quandaries, issues. Oh, we just make your list of stuff that begins to get us back to being embedded. The moment was real. But the months and the years just kind of, I don't know, distracted us, got us stuck, left us halfway. So. What I want to tell you, if you've never heard the details of a guy, you probably, have, if you've been in church for a while, you've heard of a guy named Saul or Paul. So we got to be weird about this because if you're new to the Bible, you're like, he had two names? Okay, okay. And there's actually debate over this if you don't know this. So we get introduced to him. His name is Saul. Some of us go, oh, I remember. God screams down a new name for him. Not so much if you read the text. So some believe. He had two names and that he was going by Saul originally. Some believe that God changed his name. Some believe that Paul, who started off Saul, decided when his life changed that he was going to go by a different version of his name. Hopefully all of us are super confused now, going, what in the world? Can we? The reason I got to tell you this, because when you read the Bible, you're going to come across these words, Saul and Paul, and I don't want you to be confused. I had to kind of confuse you at the beginning. Yes, I'll move on. Here we go. Okay. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Give you some details. He was anti-Christian to a level that you and I often have never witnessed personally. So he went to the high priest he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. This is what Christianity used to be called before it was called Christianity. It was called the way. In fact, it was actually considered a mockery when they would say that, oh, they follow the way. Uh, so he wants to go get all the people who say they follow the way. They follow the way of Jesus. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. That's his life. That's his gig. That's what he actually does professionally. This is his job. Go find Christians and either murder them or imprison them. It was all up to his mood for the day. He would get permission and he would seek out like intel to find these people. This guy is a bad dude. But then we keep reading. As he was approaching Damascus, which I just read to you, this is where he's going. He's got a mission. He's going to go get some Christians. On this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Logical question. <laughs> Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. What a moment. What an interruption. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. This, can we admit, this is a, a bit of a life-changing moment. <laughs> Come on. Many of us have cried out, God, if you would just speak audibly one time. 
Well, apparently, if God were to speak to you audibly one time, you need to be prepared. It's going to change your forever life, and uh, logically, it's going to knock you on your tail, okay? Just be prepared for what you wished for. (laughs) Saul has this moment. Now, watch what God does all in the meantime. See, some of us think we're in more control than we are. This is good news. No, you're not. (laughs) Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street. If you want to know if God's ever specific, I mean, come on. Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. Just stop. You can't multitask, but God can. Do you... Catch this stuff. This is like, whoa, this is kind of deep when you're thinking that God can do all of this stuff at the same time. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. So now God is introduced into the story, not just Saul, Paul, but Saul, Paul, and Ananias. This is important. If you want to talk about, and we need to talk about life change, you got to understand that God is regularly going to involve other people that you may not even know in your life to help you have life change. It happens all the time. Oftentimes we begin to think about life changes of who you know and what you can orchestrate. And did you make the right move? Parents deal with this all the time. Did I do all the right things at the right time? Exactly. You got to think bigger that God is bigger than this. You see this moment that God's like interrupting Saul's life, but he's also doing something over with this other guy. And this other guy's going, well, let let me show you what this other guy's doing. He's freaking out. But Lord, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. In other words, I don't want to meet this man. If you want to know how notorious he was, he was well known for killing people like Ananias. And God's like, I'd like for you guys to hang out. And he's like, I don't think so. Close the door. Don't answer the door. I know they're knocking, but don't come. Don't, don't. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Do you see it? At least feel a little bit of the terror there going, no, 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 no. Listen, quick lesson here. Sometimes as Christians, we're not sure we think God can change people's lives. We measure what they have done and say, ooh. And we forget that God is constantly trying to change the life of everyone he has ever created. So what happens? I'll I'll read it to you. Verse uh, 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. (laughs) I just wish I knew what it was like. Like, I don't want to do this, but fine, fine. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit instantly. Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight that God had taken from him at the moment of life change. Then he got up and was baptized. If you've ever been baptized, you might remember it. I hope you do. But so far, as I, if you don't know these details of a guy named Saul, or maybe you know him as Paul, has this life change moment. He's dead set on killing and, and imprisoning Christians. And now you've just, the dude just got baptized. He used to arrest those people. I wonder if he showed up to the baptisms going, I can't wait till they get out of the water because you're coming with me, right? Now he's the guy getting baptized. Life change, right? We see life change, life change, life. So here's my, but did it stick? (laughs) He had a moment. I read to you the moment. You got the moment. See, I think if you and I will let this guy talk to us a little bit, We can learn not just how to experience life change and introduce others to life change, but you and I can say, let me help it stick. Because it's stuck. Philippians 1, 1. This letter is from Paul. This is why we had to do the weird Saul, Paul stuff, because you're like, wait a minute, we're talking about another guy? No, we're talking about the same guy. This is after life change. Now he's writing, starting churches and writing letters to churches, and things are going way different than they started off. And he introduces himself as Paul, as a slave of Christ Jesus. If you're following Jesus with an extreme devotion, that's the language you use. 
I am a slave. He, it wasn't meant to demean himself. He was saying, I am so submitted to Jesus that I consider myself willing to do and go and be whatever he wants me to be. I am a slave. Whew. So let's read what he says. Let's just, I'll, I'll read it to you. I, I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. He's fessed it up to you and I. Hey, guess what? Just in case you get confused because I use a different name now. I was a bad dude. And it's for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Now you're like, wait a minute. He was bad, but he followed the law. He was so zealous, he thought life was all about law. And he was following it to a horrible degree. Let's go on to the next verse. I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless. Because of what, and this has got to get you a little bit, of what Christ has done. Don't forget in your mind. See, sometimes we think we have to forget the bad, that that's a Christian thing to do. We forget the bad. We don't talk about the bad. Bad's gone. He's not. He's still referring that look what God has done in my life. He, look what Christ has done. Yet, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. That is a very polished way of saying what he really said. I'm not going to say because we've got kids in the room. But he says the worst of the worst that they had in their language regarding what animals do outside. All right. You got it? I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And if you think he's done turning the volume up, <laughs> verse 10. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Can we acknowledge that he's got this, he's going after Christians, murdering them and imprisoning them. He has this moment with God, but I think we can admit now, we've seen enough of what he's been writing, that it's more than a moment now with this guy. This guy is now fully devoted, on fire for Jesus Christ. His life has been changed. It has stuck he is now spending his life starting churches everywhere he possibly can start churches. He finds himself in and out of jail. It is radical. It's why many people talk about a guy named Paul all the time. Because this guy revolutionized the news about Jesus getting out. So you and I should say, wow, you were, you were that guy. But you didn't stop halfway. You didn't get stuck there. You, you kept going. And if you think he's perfect, uh, he keeps being honest. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. <laughs> but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. The word perfection here often is better said complete. He wants to be complete. But press on. He talks about he's still pressing on, pressing on, right? You and I, you think about when you say, oh, I, I'm pressing on. I've never been eating an ice cream cone and told Katie, I just got to press through this. This is, this is really tough. I've never had a donut. Go on, I just got to press through this one, right? You, you say, I mean, I don't know what your favorite things, right? You, I'm just trying to help us understand when we say press on, I gotta pre I'm pressing on. He's talking that life is not going well. Life is difficult. This is, not, this is not easy. That's why you say the words press on. Well, you and I got to get a hold of it. This guy named Saul, now Paul, who's walking with Jesus, fully devoted to Jesus, made your life change. It's not finding it to be an easy thing to do. He has to say things. I press on. Verse 13, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past. Looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. He just said something that I think we are often screwing up. I'm not throwing on, I'm, I'm putting myself in the same bunch. You and I often screw this up because he just said something. I focus on this one thing. Now, here's what you and I have a tendency. Tendency, I'm saying this very nicely. We have a tendency, 
sometimes, that when someone says, I've got this thing you need to do, we're naturally inquisitive on, what's the thing? This is how you and I get sold stuff. I got the next best thing. And you're like, say what it is. This is why social media is a mess. Because if you watch too much of the, of the reels, you're going to be like, I got to do this. Oh, they said, don't do that anymore. Now I got to do this. And it's always this next one thing to do to begin doing this next one thing. And we live in a culture that's like, do this next one thing. Here's this new diet. Here's this new thing to do. Here's this new thing to stop doing. Oh, now, now start this one thing. You and I live in a world that values, emphasizes the next one thing. And we've lost something he just said. I focus. And I think if you want to know one of the keys to actually experiencing life change with Jesus Christ, the one thing's important. I, I'm not demeaning that in any way. The one thing's important. But your attention to focusing on it, I have found as a pastor, is one of the greatest deficiencies you'll ever face. Your actual attention to focusing on things, what I've learned is as dad, as I just, all, all the labels in my life, Focus. I have said these words to my kids. Focus. Sometimes I feel like I need to say it to you guys too. Focus, right? Will you, you might say it to me, David, focus, right? Focus. So can, let me take you through an experiment, okay? Let me just, okay, here we go. John 14, 6. If you've ever, not, maybe no one's ever taught you this. If you ever thought, hey, David, I, no one's ever discipled me. I've never, I mean, I, I love Jesus. I, I'm all about him. I, I get a little bit of the details, but no one's ever really taught me what to kind of do next. I would tell you, focus on things like John 14, 6. I would tell you, that, that's, it's a big deal. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. You need to focus on this. This is a big moment. See, that's what it is. It starts with a moment where you decide, do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? He says this, and our culture will tell you, a lot of people will tell you, no, there's, there's multiple ways to God. There's all different kind of, you can go through this God, that God, this thing, that thing, that kind of thought process, all that kind of, no, Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and life, and he is the only way. And I would tell you, if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to focus on that. And most of us will have a moment. But then we don't do anything with it which leads to then what I would describe as another moment, and another moment, and another moment, and another moment. I've done this, maybe you have too, where you had this emotional experience, this, this, uh, this religious experience, but you really didn't do any work after that. You didn't really do much with it, so you kind of waited for the next religious experience. And then you waited for the next religious experience. And then you waited for the next religious experience. And what you didn't catch on is we were becoming religious. And we began to think that it was about emotions and feelings. And then we didn't have those emotions and feelings one day. And we thought, oh, no, I've lost it. God's lost. He's left me. If you want to know what this is, this will seem harsh, but I will describe it. This is immaturity. This is called spiritual immaturity. If you're going to live your walk with God moment to moment, actually emotion to emotion, um, spiritual high to spiritual high to spiritual high to spiritual high, because not that I'm a professional on being high, but uh, you know what happens after a spiritual high, right? You know how this works. Uh, there's a spiritual low, and then you got to find a spiritual high, then a spiritual low, then a spiritual high. What I'm telling you is that's immaturity. And I, I'm telling you that not to shame you, but like, hey, let's correct this. Because you're going to get stuck halfway. That's why you're going to get stuck halfway if it's all about emotions. I'm not even using, this is not language I came up with. Paul did. Let all who are spiritually mature. He brings up maturity. He, he brings up for you and I something he seems to know that there is spiritual immaturity if he's going to bring up spiritual maturity. Let all who are spiritually mature, agree on these things, all the stuff he's been talking about. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. I love how his, he's kind. He's kind here. I believe God will help correct you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Spiritual maturity. And then he lays something out. This is a verse worth memorizing and never forgetting for the rest of your life. Again, if you've never been discipled, Philippians 3.17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. 
If you can visualize with me just for a second that you've got a lock in front of you and you need to unlock the lock, he just gave you the key to unlock to where you don't have to live life spiritually immature. You don't have to rely on some other spiritual high that you're shooting for some other time. You can actually walk with Jesus Christ for the rest of your life in a deep, thriving relationship. And he just showed it to you. When he, saw, he talks about this, uh, well, I'll show it to you, this moment. Pattern your lives after mine. Pattern. And then you pattern your life after who? After him. And learn from those who follow our example. He just gave you two things. So here's the more mature way to do it. You have a moment with God that then leads to what we call rhythms and relationships. He just said it. Patterns and people. He just talked about that if you and I want to actually grow up spiritually, you're going to have to include in your life not some spiritual high next moment and you just find the next song that you just think is awesome, which is not a bad thing, but if you're depending on that and you can't find that song. See, this is where he's like, here's what you need to do. You need to have certain rhythms in your life and certain relationships in your life and that will help you grow up spiritually. It's a profound thing. Which leads to, to stay in line with his thoughts, spiritual maturity. Let me give you a short list, very short list on rhythms and relationships. Just so we're clear, this is growing your relationship with God, not earning. I feel like I gotta bring this up, right? I think this is, I I oftentimes misunderstood when a a pastor would bring this up and be like, oh, oh, this this is where we earn that God likes us. No, this is where you grow the relationship, you mature the relationship. And this is about not being stinking lazy. (laughs) You don't need this marriage advice, but you can take what I'm sharing with you and probably plug it into a marriage or parenting or friendship or work relationship, right? You could do this. You could be like, oh yeah, I'm seeing the correlation. Yeah, apathy and laziness is typically where you have no rhythms whatsoever and you don't pay attention to the relationship. Welcome to a halfway relationship. First Timothy chapter four. Uh, Instead, train yourself to be godly. Weird. I thought God just made us godly. Apparently we need to train. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life, in this life, let me read this, promising benefits today, like before you die, like like in the here and the now and in, in the everyday walk, and in the life to come, in other words, what you and I do now seems to affect life in eternity. Whew. All right. So, so what do we do with this? Let me show you. Let me give you like, this is a crash course. Super crash course. I almost didn't do it, but I just thought maybe. Just, I'll, I'll preach on this later this year. What do rhythms look like? You're like, do, do I need to learn to dance? No. So here. Rhythms. This is, this is based out of, this is some old literature that talks about spiritual disciplines. I'm showing you a quick version of this. Do not get over like, oh my goodness. Okay, rhythms. There's inward ones. And just for example, inward ones, there's meditation of just letting God talk to you and you and I, we just shut our mouth and we just, we just let God speak. It's really hard to do. <laughs> You're like, when's it my turn? Uh, not today. You just let him talk. Prayer. Prayer's a bit more back and forth conversational. Fasting, when you give up, oftentimes food, and you devote that time to just being with God. Uh, Study, studying the word of God. We talk about this all the time, reading the Bible, learning it as as an actual rhythm. Uh, uh, And the more you read it, the more you'll understand it. Uh, There's outward one simplicity, just the idea of living a simple life, not because you're afraid of what people will think about what you own and stuff like that. No, it's deeper because the more complicated your life is, the more things that you have to take care of, it just gets really, really, really difficult. Uh, Solitude, not isolation, solitude. Welcome to, I, I mean, I think this might be like at a level of major deficiency in our world. We just don't shut things off. It seems weird if I were to say, hey, what if, what if, what if you turned your router off for a day? People would be like, get away from me. I mean, if I said it to my kids, they'd think, you're me. Submission. We live in a world now that says submission's bad. It's actually a spiritual discipline. 
Uh, service, serving others, corporate, uh, confession, having people in your life that you actually confess to, not just to God, but like people you trust where you confess to, worship, of course, guidance and celebration. This is just a short list. I'm just showing you that if you study the Bible or if you're in a small group uh, in our church, you could quickly begin to learn that there are rhythms to play out over and over and over. And if you're like, what's the value of these rhythms, David? So you don't get stuck. So you don't find yourself doing this kind of a relationship with God, where you find yourself at this part and you desperately need God, to where you're relying on emotional fixes. Uh, another thing, relationships. That was the other part. Again, this is going to be quick, but if you were to study the life of Paul, you're going to find Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. You're going to find a dynamic that he creates over time of where he becomes a mentor, but he has a friend, a buddy, someone who kind of vouches for him, and, and then he has this apprentice. Uh, some people have used the words, he becomes a challenger, and the, but he has an encourager, and then he also has someone who's a learner in his life. Let me just, I mean, literally look at me. If you want the ultimate spiritual depth, like you're like, David, I want to have like the strongest relationship ever with God. What I just showed you will take you there. But some of us are too scared to go there. Like, I don't know enough. I don't know. You got to start including these people. Do you, do you have people who encourage you? You should spiritually. Who, who, who encourage you? Who actually speak life into you? Do you have someone in your life that uh, doesn't necessarily encourage you? They actually say the stuff that no one else is saying. Where they actually ask you the stuff. They ask you the stuff like, hey, is there someone in your life that you, that you just, you, you're, you're super mean to? Is there someone in your life that you're, you're not forgiving? Or, or someone, if, if you're married, if you have someone in your life who say, hey, is there someone else that you have, might have a crush on? Or when they walk into the room, you give them more attention than you should? Yeah, these are these, those kinds of people. And then you need someone in your life that you're teaching, that you're showing. And the key is, you do this whether you feel like you know enough or not. Guess what happened day one of me being a parent? I realized how much I did not know. Our firstborn, Hayden, when I changed his diaper in the hospital, that was diaper number one of my whole life, okay? And it was awkward because the nurse was staring at me, probably going, what in the world are you doing? I remember walking out of the hospital with Hayden in this car seat, right? This tank of a system, right? You got to protect your kid. And I'm sitting, the whole time we're putting Hayden into the car going, are they really letting us go? Do they know what I do not know? Because I don't, I think I could get arrested right now where they'd be like, you can't be a dad. Guess what? Hayden's doing okay. <laughs> Why don't we let this play out with God? Get someone in your life and say, hey, I'm going to teach you something. What are you going to teach me? I don't know yet. But we're going to read the Bible together. And when you ask me questions, I'm going to go find answers. Welcome to how you learn how to parent. I want to end this way. Not to take a, a major right turn, but I want your minds to be on Paul all week long. No, better, 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 better. I want your minds to be on Saul all week long. Do you know that you're around Saul's all the time? People who don't know Jesus, and if you would just introduce them, they might actually have a life-changing experience. But you've got to be brave enough and bold enough to say, hey, 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 hey. In our terms here, come with me to Easter. What if, what if God has more souls out there who he wants to start churches with, who he wants to change this globe with? What if, and what if you know him and you're close to him? Not to treat him like a project, but to introduce him to Jesus. Can you imagine? And let me just tell you, if you're willing to do that, you have entered into the lifestyle of Paul where you refuse to stay halfway. We're so glad you tuned in today. Fountain Springs Church is located in the Black Hills of South Dakota, but our community reaches beyond our neighborhoods and spreads around the whole world. Our website is a great way to give, get involved, and get connected. 
If you appreciate our ministry and want to be part of our mission to show people who Jesus is, here's what I'd recommend. Join us financially. When you do that, you're giving other people the opportunity to hear what you just heard. So here's a way to do that. Visit our website at fs.church slash give. And thank you so much for being with us today. And let's do our best this week to show people who Jesus is.